career path and how did you get to the positions where, where you are today? And maybe we can start uh, Doina, Nando and Jan, just alphabetical order by first name. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, great pleasure to uh, be here at the EML again. Uh, my name is Doina Prikap. I uh, started my career actually in Romania. I was an undergraduate student at the Technical University of Cluj-Napoca, uh, which was actually a, a great uh, place. Uh, lots of uh, colleagues there have uh, actually gone on to, uh, to very successful careers uh, in the tech industry. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough to uh, get a Fulbright Fellowship, uh, so I was able to uh, leave uh, to study in the United States. And the funding was really crucial because otherwise I would not have afforded to do that. Uh, I did my master's at and PhD at University of Massachusetts Amherst uh, with Rich Sutton, and that's where I discovered reinforcement learning. And uh, that was uh, my main focus of uh, research ever since. And uh, after uh, getting my degree, I uh, went straight to McGill University uh, as a professor, and I spent uh, the time since actually uh, in Canada and Montreal at McGill. Uh, but since uh, 2017, I was uh, lucky enough to uh, also be able to uh, become affiliated with uh, DeepMind, and I currently uh, lead the research team of uh, DeepMind in Montreal. Thank you. Uh, Nando? Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, um, it would have been even greater to be here with all of you right now, um, but we'll make the most of it. Um, so my trajectory was I, I came from Africa. I studied uh, first in, in South Africa at a place called Wits University which is where Gaussian processes were invented, for those of you uh, who are into it, and where a lot of other people in machine learning, you've probably heard about, like people like Shakir and so on have come from. And um, I was introduced to neural networks in my undergrad project by a professor there. And I got interested and I did well with my masters and so on. So I ended up um, getting a scholarship to study in Cambridge. So I went and I started, did my PhD there. Um, that was followed by a postdoc at Berkeley in the US. And then I became faculty in Canada at the University of British Columbia. I was there for uh, a long time, 12 years or so. And then I moved to Oxford uh, looking for new adventures. And then when uh, DeepMind sort of took off uh, a few years ago with all the sort of excitement that was going on in AI, I ended up bit by bit slowly moving into DeepMind and I'm now full-time at DeepMind. Thank you. Uh, Jan? Yeah, so uh, happy to be here. Uh, uh, as for me, my path started about you know, 10 years ago uh, in Montreal. I was training neural networks uh, for fun during the weekend late at night and uh, near the end of my bachelor's, I was lucky enough to connect with Yoshio Benjo and that's where, you know, the adventure really took off. Uh, I first started my master's with him, then transitioned to PhD. I, during my PhD, I worked in a startup that uh, he had co-founded. And uh, after graduation, I, I moved to the Bay Area, worked at uh, Facebook, we did a lot of awesome stuff there. And uh, I heard that Google was uh, opening, you know, the first uh, AI lab, their first AI lab in Africa. So I decided to move there to kind of help out and help build the team. So. That's impressive. So thank you all for, for sharing your, uh, your experience. Uh, so yeah, as uh, as I mentioned, we will go through uh, through a few different uh, topics. So how to do research in machine learning, how to read machine learning papers, how to write a machine learning paper, and and then if that's not enough, like it's hard enough to get your paper accepted, how do I get my paper cited and not overlooked by the by the community? So maybe let's just start with some warm up questions. Um, uh, so. What, what is a remarkable paper that you've read in the past few months and what made it remarkable for you? Uh, and then a follow-up question from the papers that you've written yourself, of which one are you most proud of? Is it, is it the most cited paper that you're most proud of or is it a different paper and why? So maybe, yeah, we can keep the order with uh, Doin, Anando and Jan, or if anyone wants to jump in, uh, please. <laughs> 
So uh, in terms of remarkable papers, actually, uh, one of the remarkable papers that I read, reread recently is Oliver Selfridge's Pandemonium Architecture paper. This is a paper from the late 50s, uh, and I was reading it because I had to give a talk about hierarchical reinforcement learning, and I was thinking of the historical context. Um, and it's a paper in which he introduces this concept of having a distributed learning architecture with these little demons inside an agent's head that are all shouting out predictions, and then there's a essentially a decision maker on top that takes those predictions in and, uh, and then decides what to do. Uh, and it's really interesting to see a paper that's so old and yet has so many ideas that are related to modern deep learning and reinforcement learning uh, that are in it. So, so uh, I really like that. And then another paper that I really enjoyed reading recently, this is a recent paper by Yael Niv uh, called Learning Task State Representations. And it's one of these papers that's at the uh, reinforcement learning in the brain uh, interface. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's an overview of a body of work that her lab carried out um, on um, learning representations in the context of reinforcement learning and what does it mean for an agent to focus in its attention, uh, how does that affect learning good representations. Um, and it also reminded me again of some older ideas like clustering and the role of clustering uh, in this field. So those are my two, uh, two recent finds. Um, and then um, from the papers that I've written, I am most proud still of the options paper, just because I think it made a big impact and also I just still like to do that kind of research. So. Nice. Okay, Nando, if you want to take over. Let's see. So the first question, both of these questions are incredibly hard actually. Um, I've read several papers, I would say, that I like. I think every time I read a paper and there's a new insight in it or a new way in which I could sort of think about a problem, I, I find that useful. I, I couldn't say that my knowledge comes from one or two papers, but it's. Uh, I think this is going to come up later. Um, but since I'm pressed for this, I'll just basically say papers of this week, or oh, the last two weeks. So I finally went and read GPT-3. Um, uh, the OpenAI paper. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend you read it. It's a very interesting paper. Um, it, it's a very provocative view on AI. It's very ambitious. Um, and I kind of like those uh, papers. Um, it's also provocative because you, you could question their empirical methodology and so on, um, and the hype, and the fact that can train them these models with infrastructure that most of the planet is not capable of ever dreaming of <laughs> building. But it's nonetheless, it's it's an exciting paper. It's an exciting direction. It's about the future, about the AI. It's about the, the, the vision. So I, I, I like that aspect of it. Um, and, and like Dorina pointed out, funny enough, I was also reading a, an oldie. Uh, I was reading a paper on prediction games and boosting by yeah, um, I think the title, I actually have it here as one of my tabs. Um, Game Theory, Online Prediction and Boosting by your Freund and Rob Shapir. Um, and I love it because um, it's a paper that very cleanly ties online learning uh, with game theory and with these sort of adversarial games that, that agents could play in order to learn. So for people who like things like GANs and so on, I highly recommend going and reading this paper. There's stuff to be done at that interface. In terms of um, papers I've written, I don't know if, and I, and I think this is a terrible thing to say because a lot of these papers, I was not a main author and there were other people who, who did the work and who are really bright researchers and and came up with wonderful things. But I think deep down, I'm always unhappy with my past work and I'm <laughs> always thinking about the next paper <laughs> I'll write or the next project. Um, so yeah, that will be, I guess, none. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that is kind of the researcher mode, right? We always want the new thing, the new, yeah, yeah we're always excited about the new thing and we think, oh, the previous thing, Oh, now that we know how we've done it, it's not so interesting anymore. So, 
Yeah, it's a terrible thing. I wonder if it's one day we'll also figure out intelligence and there was once we figured it out, we'll be like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about you, Jan? What are your, uh, your favorites? Yeah, so I agree with Nando on both counts. Like the first question is very hard because there's so many awesome papers coming out, you know, all the time. Uh, so it was really difficult for me to select, but something that came to mind was uh, adversarial examples are not bugs, they are features. And uh, this is a paper by Andrew Ilias and collaborators, many of them. And uh, what I found pretty remarkable about the paper is that there's been tremendous interest around uh, adversarial examples, how to have robustness uh, to these types of uh, But there, I feel like there have been few papers questioning some of the assumptions uh, behind all this. And this is one of the papers that investigates this. And what they find is that uh, while we kind of assume that these adversarial perturbations are quite senseless, actually a, a lot of these adversarial so-called examples are really due to the presence of features that we can't quite perceive, that are also not very robust, that are brittle, but that are actually quite predictive of the class. And so that helps explain this very puzzling phenomenon, basically by you know, questioning uh, our assumptions. As for you know, paper that you know, I've written that I'm most proud of, again, I, I really feel the same way as Nando. I always feel like it's my next paper. So, uh, but it turns out that one of the things I'm working on is continuing one of my previous work, which is mix up, which I really like because uh, whenever we explain the idea to somebody, they're very confused and like, really? You really just average the example? And we're like, yes, and it works very well. So I, I would say that just for the fun of it. Okay, great. So I think our listeners will already have taken notes about the new papers to, for them to read and inspiring papers. Okay, so let's see. Um, uh, okay, so we start with the first, uh, first set of questions, how to do research. Uh, and uh, the first question that came from many, many of the participants uh, is what mathematical topics must I master to succeed in machine learning and how to acquire this mathematical skills, especially if I am from, a, if I don't have a background in mathematics or in computer science. Uh, so maybe for the order, we can start with Nando. Uh, so the, the little uh, yellow dot there indicates the order to, in which to, to go over the question. So. Nando, Jan, doing at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I mean, calculus and linear algebra are important. I think you need that at least. Um, and I think there are resources like Khan Academy, for example, is one that I quite like. There's a lot of, it's a beautiful online resource to go and learn all about sort of matrix, algebra, vectors, um, gradients, and so on. And, and I think with, uh, with just those skills, I think a lot of what exists in machine learning is accessible. Oh, you also need, of course, on, uh, you need to know the basics of probability um, and statistics, know what expectations are, uh, what's a probability distribution and so on. But I think with those skills, um, you should be able to start doing, be able to start reading the papers. Great. Any additional uh, additional resources uh, from Ian or advice? Uh, yeah, I would just add that uh, you know there isn't one size that fits all. Machine learning is actually a very varied field. There's multiple ways of looking at it. Recently, there's many people from a physics background that have been entering the field and doing great work, doing crossover between you know machine learning and physics. So it, it depends on what your interests are, but definitely having a good grasp of calculus is pretty important. Yeah, thank you. Doina? The only thing I would add to that is optimization can be very useful, some notions of optimization. Um, but you don't need to block on the fact that you don't know all the math before you start doing things. So I think as Nando was saying, with basic linear algebra and calculus and, and probability theory, you can go a very long way, start reading papers. Uh, and then oftentimes it's when you read papers that you realize, oh, there's some other toolkit that maybe I'm missing. 
and you can go look for that. And uh, Khan Academy is, is really good for, for basic uh, skills. And then, of course, there's so much stuff on YouTube these days, so many really good lectures uh, from top universities on all kinds of math topics. So it's easy to find good material if, if you want to study, even if you don't have classes offered in your university. And it's fun sometimes to do it in a study group to keep motivated. So like if you have a couple of friends that, that you can do it with just to make yourself sort of sit and watch the lectures and discuss them afterwards, it can be helpful. Yeah, I think that's actually a great idea. So actually here at the school in the rocket chat of the school, we have a channel with basics, uh, basics of ML and uh, we've collected resources for beginners in ML and we've included, for example, the list that DeepMind collected uh, with external resources for, uh, for learning about, about AI. And Duena's idea is great. So we encourage participants to create such a study group uh, from, from the participants that you've met here at the school and yeah, motivate uh, each other to, to start uh, learning more about, uh, about the field. Okay, so yeah, let's move to the next, uh, next question. Is there an optimal path to navigate successfully the ML landscape? Should I start with supervised, unsupervised NRL or is there another combination that might work, uh, work better? What, what is your opinion? Jan, should we start with you? Sure. So I think that you might be tempted to just start with very complex, you know, deep learning algorithms. But I think the the best way to start is to grasp the fundament the fundamentals. So starting out with very simple classical uh, machine learning algorithms, very simple, maybe even linear regression or even naive bias based. Um, I think that's a good idea. Just understanding what you're really doing when you do the training updates, understanding you know what's happening, not necessarily perfectly, but really grasping what's happening behind the hood and then building up from there, I think is the right way. Right. I, I absolutely agree with that point. Um, um, the fundamentals and also learn things like, you know, with the fundamentals, you already start learning about concepts like cross validation and so on, which are at the heart of everything we do. Um, so I would definitely go from that perspective as opposed to try to look at this uh, clustering of supervised versus unsupervised, which is kind of we often just create this for teaching purposes. It's not like the world is divided like this. Uh, so I think what's most important is to get a good grasp of fundamentals with linear models, as Ian mentioned, and with cross validation, um, you know, understand mixture models, even just like how to fit a Gaussian, etc. Lena? Plus 100 for the fundamental. <laughs> That's all I will say. Great, and I think we've had some great lectures at the school on uh, on fundamentals. So with uh, with Razvan, and we've had the lecture on optimization. Uh, so I think, yeah, we, we've set the fundamentals for for the for you to get started in uh, in the field. So yeah, I think that's a good uh, that's a good point. Okay, how should I choose a research topic? Should I go for depth or for breadth? Uh, should I go to industry or academia? Should I do a PhD? at all or should I just uh, start working directly so th these are more qu several questions uh, put together but uh, choose which uh, which one you would like to to address so maybe we start again with Jan yeah that's a really like uh, you know wide question so so many ways to answer it maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pick you know just just one maybe how to choose a research topic uh, I think it's it's more of a process, and I think the process is just read a lot of papers that you find interesting, read their references, uh, just just learn more about you know the literature, and it's also important to get hands-on experience. So you know once you've built up from the fundamentals, maybe you start re-implementing some papers, and maybe you ask a a question that you're curious about about that paper, uh, you know. Uh, they mention a weakness, or they mention an experiment that they haven't done. Maybe try that, you know, experiment, and then you can go, you can get a sense of, you know, what you like, what you're interested in, and you you can build up from there. That's what I would say. Then maybe just to follow up in terms of industry and academia. So, 
have you do you have experience in academia or you jumped directly in the industry after finishing your PhD? Yeah, I, I jumped directly into the industry uh, after my PhD. Uh, for me, deciding between you know academia and industry, I think academia is super interesting. But my feeling is that. I, from what I've seen a lot of times people that do go into academia, kind of, they were kind of set on it from the beginning, kind of like, you know, the people who want to become medical doctors, they often knew for a long time that's what they want to do. For me, I'm interested in, in it, but maybe at a later stage, right? That, that's, that's just my thoughts on that. Okay. Great. Dana? Um, in terms of choosing a research topic, that's a very personal thing. and. Uh, one thing that I would emphasize is you should not necessarily choose a topic because it's uh, modern or it's hot right now. So, uh, you know, I thought when I went to do my PhD that I was going to study decision trees because at the time decision trees were very hot. Um, and then I ended up studying reinforcement learning that I knew nothing about, but it was, it was really interesting and turned out actually in terms of long-term impact to be much more important. So I think you shouldn't have preconceived ideas and you should always keep an open mind. And you have to find something that also fits the kind of research that you like to read about and the kind of research for which you have the skills. Like some, some topics can be quite interesting when you read about them, but maybe it's hard for you to, uh, to go in that direction because you don't have the math or you don't have the programming skills or whatever. So it has to be a balance between um, what's interesting and, and uh, what you can do uh, successfully. Um, the PhD really is a chance to me to do something really in depth, like to pick a topic and really study it. And the way I think about it is at the end of the PhD, you should be the expert in that topic and, and you should take the time, read all the background and understand the issues. And it's really the, the only time in your life when you have the luxury to spend a few years studying something in depth because afterwards life gets very busy and there's like all kinds of things that pile on, whether you're in academia or in industry. Um, but during the, the PhD, it's this really sweet period of a few years where you can spend the time learning things and understanding something uh, in depth. And in terms of industry versus academia, I mean, there's lots of trade-offs. Again, it, it can be a very personal choice. Uh, academia definitely requires the ability to multitask because you have to teach and you have to write grants and you have to do research and you have a lab of students and those students require support that is non-technical support, right? To like somebody to chat with because they have problems and whatnot. So it's much more of a lots of different things that you have to do. Um, in industry, it can be more focused because you're in a research group and research is your main uh, obligation and your main focus. Uh, the scale of things that you do can also be very different, right? Industry, there's there's more infrastructure support, uh, there's more compute, so so you can be more ambitious in some sense, but then it's all teamwork, right? So you are part of a larger team that has a big ambition, whereas in, in academia it can be more uh, individualized, right? It's you and your lab and, you know, maybe a few collaborators, but, but it can be uh, more smaller scale projects. So uh, I don't know if it's one versus the other, right? There's, there's, it's a choice. And what I would recommend is just when, if you are a graduate student, to try things out, to see what you like. So if there's an opportunity to teach a class while you are a PhD student, take that opportunity and try it out. You might find that you really love teaching. You might find that you really hate teaching. Right, but but if you don't try it ahead of time, it can be kind of a cold shower once you start the job, and now you have to do it whether you you like it or not. Uh, if you can do an internship, definitely do an internship because that way you see what it's like to be an in, in an industrial research lab. What is the day to day life? How do people decide on topics? What's the team like? So as many opportunities as you can to experience these aspects, different aspects of of a research life, it's useful to to take that. Uh, I agree with uh, everything Doina said. I think that that's a brilliant way um, to answer this question. Um, I would just add to it that um, 
when searching for the things that you like, also think about not the things you will like then, but the things you will like in five years. Because <laughs> it may be that the path to be where you want to be in five years is not the, the easiest path. <laughs> You know, don't do like uh, something you enjoy now and then end up spending the rest of your life doing something you don't enjoy. Sometimes you have to t do hard things. You might have to take that optimization course, even if you think it's hard, because once you have acquired those skills, it will be much easier for you to be training deep nets or whatever. So you should approach this as an RL person. <laughs> so think about the long horizon. But the other thing that is very common now with machine learning is multidisciplinary efforts. Uh, interdisciplinary efforts. So um, again, as um, as was pointed out already, it's it, this is a very personal choice. So and for some of you, some of you will have a lot of experience with biology, or with any other of the sciences, or uh, economics and so on. And that puts you in a special place if that's your case. Um, because for example, I, I mean, I wish there were more people at, at present in the world who knew a lot about both machine learning and how viruses work. That would come in very handy. Um, or even like for more substantial problems, machine learning and policy and, 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 and you know, and how governments should uh, best make decisions or machine learning and economics, you know, how do different, being able to use machine learning tools to study different taxing systems and so on and, and the effects of offshore accounts, et cetera, in the world. Um, so I think if you work on something else that where machine learning could be used, um, that's actually quite a fruitful uh, direction. And I think that's uh, we're gonna see a lot more of that in the future. Erika, you are muted. <clears throat> Looks like we're having some technical difficulties. Well, can we t take questions from the audience? Perhaps. <laughs> I think we can go on to the next question. I'm not sure that they have the ability to ask live questions because it's it's live streamed on YouTube, but okay. I don't know that we have a direct uh, direct path to that. Um, the next okay, question. She, she, she did say to continue with the next question. Okay, the next question on our list was uh, if people have limited computational resources, what kind of uh, machine learning research uh, can they still do? Um, so I don't know, Jan, do you want to start with that one? Okay, sure. Um, well, obviously I think you can still do a lot of research with uh, less resources. Uh, obviously one of the first things you could maybe try is work on the problem of low resource computation, which I'm super interested in. I think we need way more work in that area. Uh, but you can also work on other problems. Um, I guess there's like maybe like you could say like two big ways of working on it. Either you could work on a small data set with like you know a huge model, or you know a big realistic data set with a smaller model. I think uh, you know it, it depends on 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 the task that you're doing, which is the best way of doing it. But oftentimes I find that you know working on a challenging benchmark, but let's say with a a smaller model than what is, you know, the absolute state of the art is is fine, is great. Like many people are training with mobile net on ImageNet or, you know, ResNet 50 or ResNet 18. And this research is well cited and, you know, well seen. So I think that's one way of working uh, with, you know, less uh, computational resources. Nando, what about you, Nando? Uh, yeah, I, ag I agree with that. I think being able to do machine learning with few resources is a very important challenge. Um, um, in, in, yeah, there we need to address questions of like uh, energy efficiency, communication, um, you know, sizes of models and so on. 
Um, so like even like going back to the inspiration, just like the people who built Confidence and LSTMs did, um, look back at the animals or, or you know the brains of animals and then see uh, what's special about brains that allow those brains to sort of be effective at uh, doing computation with very low resources. I mean, there's still some things about topology of uh, natural brains, like for example, sparsity and so on, that are not mirrored in our artificial neural networks. So it would be worth investigating that to try to understand why that is the case. At the same time, there remain so many open questions that I don't think are questions of scale. Um, trying to understand what, uh, what are, for example, how to come up with good causal explanations, um, how do or how building models that are capable of being aware of their own awareness. In, a, in other words, models that know what they know and they know what they don't know, that sort of metacognition. We haven't figured out how to build into models. Um, um, even like things like when we evaluate RL agents, when we deploy a policy without deploying it, like for example, in a medical situation, we would like to be able to predict how well will this policy do. And so off policy, that we call this off policy evaluation, and just, that's an open problem. That's, I imagine there's a few PhDs to be written on that topic. Um, so yeah, we still have many important conceptual problems. I think the frontiers are still open. Um, scale, of course, matters. I think some of the most important things that are happening in, in, in AI and so on in the last few years have to do, you know, in trying to push scale. Uh, but it's not the only thing. That there's been some inventions uh, that have uh, that have led to a lot of progress that have not necessarily been involved uh, uh, had to do with scale. LSTMs came to be, confidence came to be, not uh, as be uh, because researchers were thinking of scale. Yeah, that, those right. are really useful answers. I think uh, I'm not sure I have anything else to add. Um, the next question is, what is incremental and what is original research? And should I should people focus on solving tasks or competing on benchmarks or study more theoretical underlying uh, principles? So Nando, do you want to, uh, to start with that? Um, maybe Jan? <laughs> <laughs> I just finished. <laughs> okay. Jan, go for it. Oh, you're muted, Jan. Oops. <laughs> yes, I am muted. No, I was saying, uh, Doina, why, why, don't, why don't you go instead? Um, I can certainly go. I, mean, I think uh, to me, it's really important to focus on, uh, on fundamentals. Um, and, and so what does that mean? That can mean theory. Uh, but that can also mean conceptual research, like setting up frameworks, ways of defining things, ways of thinking about uh, about stuff. So, you know, Nando brought up causality. I think that's a really interesting and exciting topic. And I feel like, you know, it's one of these places where we don't necessarily know what's the one right way to think about the topic yet. And supervised learning, similar sort of thing. Like we have lots of different methods, but in some sense, the one unified vision uh, is not quite there yet. So I think it's it's good to focus on fundamentals. Now, this uh, sometimes when you then write the paper, the paper can look very simple, and that's a good thing. Like if the paper looks look simple, it's a sign that you are doing something right that you've thought about it and digested it and and it's nice and clean. And I tend to prefer that kind of work to let's say lots of bells and whistles and tricks. And, and uh, you know, I take some model that, uh, that somebody already kind of came up with and I add three different regularizers to it. And now it beats the state of the art. And whenever I, I look at that, I keep thinking, well, so what? Like we beat the state of the art, have we understood anything more than when we started or not? And so to me, I think it's really important to focus on understanding and and building models that are um, that are geared towards understanding. Um, of course, it's fun to build to beat the state of the art. Uh, if it's a very big, ambitious project, right? Um, so to me, Go was one of these things, right? An amazing achievement because it was such a big game. Nobody thought this was possible, and so it was great that 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 we kind of cracked it. But 
um, you know, if I take the gym environment and I beat the state of the art and my agent gets, you know, 10% more return than your agent, well, you know, that's, I'm, I'm lukewarm on that kind of achievement. I don't know, Nando or Jan, you want to jump in on this one? Oh, yeah, maybe I, I would add one thing is, um, yeah, so in, in research, maybe you decide in the beginning, oh, I'm going to work on something original or something incremental. Though I, I've never done that, and I'm not sure anyone actually does. But what I do know is that you don't really know where the project is going to go later on, right? So you may start working on something incremental and actually stumble into very interesting completely novel questions or solutions. So to me, I, I think the kind of like what, what Don is suggesting, really what's important is, you know, asking interesting questions and trying to answer those questions, right? So, and, and I think if you do that, you're gonna be okay. Okay, uh, thank you. I hope you can hear me now. Apologies for the for the technical glitch. So let's, uh, let's move on. Um, <clears throat> So I think we are at this question, how to gain intuition on which ideas are worth pursuing? Because as a PhD student or researcher, you might have several ideas at a, at a time. How do I decide which one to pursue? And also importantly, when should I drop an idea? Like I run a few experiments, they don't work. When do I decide to, to drop and to move to something else? And maybe we start with Jan Doina, uh, but yeah, as you prefer. Okay. Um, well, I, I think this is where having collaborators is very useful and even better if you have an advisor, you can, uh, you know, gain from their experience. Uh, and it's also important to uh, gain from doing things. So writing papers uh, yourself, reading papers, all of these things will, will, you know, help you gain a better intuition. As to when to drop an idea, I mean, all of these questions are kind of tricky. Uh, but one thing I can say about dropping a, an idea is that actually you don't need to drop it forever. One advice that I really like from Feynman is that, you know, whenever you realize that, okay, you can't necessarily solve this problem, but you really care about it, just keep it in mind. And whenever you learn a new trick, just recall that old problem and check, does this help me with, with you know, with this idea? Does this, does this new trick help me improve my idea? And, and so you don't necessarily ever entirely give up on an idea. So. That, that's what I would say. Yeah, that's a, that's a great advice. Yeah, uh, Doina? Yeah, I totally yeah. agree that you don't necessarily need to drop an idea, but you should absolutely put ideas on ice uh, when it doesn't seem like they're panning out or if there's a lack of enthusiasm from collaborators or or, or so on, right? And it's, it's also true, and, you know, especially for, for students, it's important to realize that not everything that you think of will end up being published. Uh, you know, maybe partly because it doesn't work, maybe partly because it actually takes a lot of work to take an idea and actually turn it into something that is publishable or published. Uh, and a lot of that work uh, is not necessarily fun work. Uh, you know, the idea, getting the idea is really exciting, right? It's new and it's, you know, there's like a shot of adrenaline. And then there's like this grunt work that has to be done to implement all baselines and compare against the baselines and run it on different environments. And, you know, results can be middling and sometimes you need to find some other way of, of doing things in order to, to really get the mileage out of it. And then you have to write it up and explain it clearly. So, uh, you know, it's not so much about the idea, like you have to be ready to put in the work. And if it's, you know, really not panning out, then it's okay to ice it and to move on to, to something else. And like Dan said, maybe in the future, there will be new tools uh, that, that you can use to, to crack it. Yeah, Nando, something I mean, to add? I mean, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I would add to it that a lot of science is about falsification. We should set ourselves to break down our ideas and break other people's <laughs> ideas. Uh, it, that's, you know, we're always trying constantly 
um, to get a better understanding of the world. And this tool of, of creating a hypothesis and then setting up an experiment to corroborate it or falsify it um, is very much how, how we work. But you just corroborate, you don't prove it's truth. You can prove that it's false, but you never ultimately prove that it's true because someone else, you know, Newton never proved that his laws were true, and eventually it was proved. It was proven later that they were much more limited than he would have anticipated. I imagine. Um, so it's okay to try something and then realize that it's not right. I mean, that that's the nature of it. And, and, and I guess to minimize the sort of disappointments and so on, as was already pointed out, we, you know, right from the beginning, try to surround yourself by a circle of, uh, the, by a trust network of collaborators and so on, and, and use that as your brainstorming circle. Uh, there's nothing more precious than being able to have people who you can just go and throw their idea, your idea at them, and you can trust that they will try to break your idea. <laughs> and and you know, hopefully they'll do it in a nice way. And maybe as a follow-up, I know in DeepMind we're discussing this very often, like we publish things that work, but then they're like, uh, to get to that thing that we published, actually we've tried many, many other things that didn't work and we don't publish this. And we, so many other people will repeat the same mistakes because we don't publish, but there seems there doesn't seem to be an obvious way to share this kind of failures in a way that uh, that can help others not to follow in the same uh, in the same mistakes or in the same it's not a mistake in the same uh, path. So I don't know if you have any any intuition or any I don't know any advice any opinion on this. Um, maybe in the papers should we describe more the things that didn't work actually or do you have any opinion on this? I think it's a good it's um, it's good writing practice actually to actually in in when you write a paper you, you know say we also tried these other things but they didn't work um, and you can say that in words or you can actually add plots and so on so yeah. to some extent we do that in the papers of course we might have worked on something that never made it in any way <laughs> to any topic that we ever published and so. In that case, yeah, in that case, I don't know. I mean, sometimes when we go to conferences, we chat with our colleagues and they might say, oh, I want to try this. And you're like, no, don't bother with that part. <laughs> <laughs> that was a waste of a year. Yeah. Okay, so maybe we move on to the next, uh, next question. Uh, with so many pub papers published every day, how do we escape the feeling that, okay, everything has been solved? Uh, how do we find the path? How do we find yeah, the way to, to move uh, forward and to actually make a contribution? Uh, Doina, you want to start? So I think archive is a very useful uh, tool for disseminating knowledge, but it is completely overwhelming uh, for, for a new person to the field. If you are watching archive and you have notifications when papers come on, that is just unhelpful. Um, so you know, the way that I think about it is if you are starting to study a particular question, uh, you do the background reading for that uh, at that time, and then you move on to uh, to doing your work. Um, and then there, there should be a few times during the year where you look at the field and you look at the field in connection to the things that you're interested in, uh, and you read papers, right? So this used to be the conference cycle, right? I would go to ICML in Europe and and uh, see all these talks, and then you know we'd have a reading group for two or three weeks uh, with the lab to go, to go through the interesting papers and and to uh, to talk about them. Um, and I find that mode much more helpful than to sort of watch continually what is going on on archive. And I think there, you know. It does take a bit of effort to uh, to sort of decide that you want to stop and just focus on your own thing, but it is important uh, to do that. Uh, and, and you do that after you've done your homework, after you've figured out that, yes, the idea I'm working on is an interesting idea, has not been done at least yet at the time of, that we're talking. Now I can spend two months, three months working on it, um, right? And, and hopefully, uh, you know, nobody will scoop me. Um, 
I know that it's a it's a very difficult time to be a junior person in the field because there's a lot of interest and there's so many people. Um, I have seen previous booms and it was a difficult time then too, even though the field was maybe 10 times smaller, but it still felt like, like a lot of people. Uh, but, you know, there are lots of ideas still that need to be sorted out and there's a lot of progress that we still need to make. Um, and so you have, have to have a little bit of faith also in, in yourself that, uh, that you can actually make it and, and just forge ahead. Great, uh, great advice. Uh, Nando, you want to so, add? Okay. Um, about a week ago, I discovered that uh, there were 60 papers on archive by the same individual. <laughs> this year only. <laughs> so there's someone who's been doing quite well and doing the lockdown in terms of writing <laughs> papers or, or, or associating his name in papers or whichever way. Um, and just following that one individual would have been impossible for me just as I could keep up with. Uh, and that should not be, I, I think we should identify interesting topics as Duane was pointing out. And then and then if there's a per paper on the topic that interests you, um, then, then what I would rather advise instead of going to archive necessarily is to type that, look at that paper on Google Scholar. Google Scholar is so important see which papers have cited that paper. Follow the, uh, basically, there's for each paper on Scholar, there are two trees, the tree to the future, and then the tree, I, I, I guess it well, becomes like a, a full graph in the end. But there's a tree to the past, the things that it cites. And then there are the papers that cite it in the future. So you can jump to the papers that cite it in the future. For the papers that cite it, you can see which papers uh, those other papers cite. And through that, you quickly build a sort of net uh, of understanding of how the, the, the sort of concept has been explored across different fields. And, and so you can get into depth into this uh, particular topic and you can understand it really well. Um, and then you can sort of look at the recent papers on that topic. Um, occasionally, it's nice to, you just for fun of it, go, go on Twitter or, or your archive feed or go to, to, to uh, feed or go to a conference and find out what other things are going on in the field. Um, but no, it's impossible to to be tracking every paper that comes out, out of archive. Or sometimes even if in a very narrow field, it's just impossible. And I think it's actually counterproductive. You should just like focus on doing something and doing it well and pick a problem that interests you um, and make a contribution there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So let me maybe just focus on the part of you know how to escape the everything has been solved feeling. Uh, first, I, I would say it's really just a feeling. I think the reality is that we're far from having solved everything. In fact, I would say we've solved uh, very little. But if you're looking at you know what's the topics that are popular today, maybe on on some subspace of it. It appears we've solved a lot, but it's because you're focusing there. If you look around, there's so many problems we're not talking about because we're doing very poorly at solving these problems. So uh, I, it's basically, as Doina suggested, uh, maybe don't focus as much on necessarily what's popular right now. Ask yourself, you know, what you find interesting or what skills you have, where, where could they best be applied, what, what kind of problems you, you could best contribute to, and focus on that. Great. Uh, let's move on. Okay, so the second part is very related to what uh, has already been discussed now, how to read papers. So this, the, how to stay up to date with the literature, if you want to go again, like from your own uh, experience, how do you keep up with, uh, with the, if you want to repeat any, any advice on that? Uh, Nando, you want to start? I think, um... I would say Google Scholar, um, already my previous okay. rant, I yeah. think, applies here. <laughs> Jan? Uh, okay, so let's uh, add to that. I would say, obviously, yes, Google Scholar, great reference. Uh, you have alerts also on Google Scholar that, that can be useful if there are some people that you know uh, uh, do work that you're pretty interested in. You, you can set alerts to uh, receive emails when they publish new stuff. 
Uh, I find it useful to follow certain people on Twitter. Oh, and the main thing I think that is really useful, I, I think again, like having collaborators is, you know, the name of the game. So rely on your collaborators to read papers and send you interesting stuff. Yeah. And you can take a step further, have reading meetings where, you know, you share papers more widely. I, I think that's, that's how I stay up to date. Yeah, I think reading clubs are really important. Uh, like if you have, and you can do two kinds of things, right? You can do reading clubs where you do sort of like speed, you know, five minutes per paper. The ICML papers are out. Let's spend, you know, five minutes each talking about a paper that we like. So that gives you kind of breadth. And then you can have reading clubs that are more in depth, right? I want to learn about model based reinforcement learning. Now we make a curated list of papers where people contribute their ideas and then everybody takes turns and, and talks about it. I think it's it's a really good way of, you know, distributing the effort of reading carefully papers and also practicing how to talk about existing work in a, in a clear way. Uh, and again, like it, for me, it's always been helpful to have this like network of collaborators like Jan says that keeps you motivated and, and you can bounce off ideas. And sometimes, you know, reading a paper turns into a brainstorming about questions from that paper that can then turn into, you know, let's try to work on something together. Yeah. So, okay, the devil is in the details. So only skimming papers uh, sometimes is not, is not enough. How much time should I dedicate to reading papers? Should I just read papers or reproduce them? So for example, Doina, for your PhD students, do you recommend them to, to reproduce papers, to re-implement papers, or what is your, your advice there? Uh, maybe we start with Doina, sorry, <laughs> continue. Uh, so I think that it's, um, it depends on the students and the papers. <laughs> um, in some cases, so for beginning students, especially in classes, right, when they take intro machine learning, intro reinforcement learning, it's really useful to go through the process of actually implementing an algorithm and seeing how it works and understanding all of the bugs that can happen, right? And that can, you know, cause things not to learn at all and, and all this stuff. So at the very beginning, it's when you're learning the basics, it's very important to, to go through this exercise. Um, and and uh, later on, it then depends it's sort of like depends on your focus. So if you are in a particularly empirical field and you know that there will be baselines that you need to compare against or you're building off of, then actually it's really good to try and reproduce the results rather than just using existing code because that will help you, first of all, understand if you really understand the paper. And second of all, uh, you know, it's nice to reproduce because that tells you that this code, you know, the idea of math, right? The code can run on a different data set, on a different compute infrastructure, right? With with slightly different implementation and so on. If it still runs, that's that's really great. Um, do you have to reproduce every paper? Definitely not, right? Uh, it, it's really the things that are close to your core research where uh, where that is a useful exercise later on. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, maybe Nando, maybe we can switch to you. Yeah, it, it depends on the paper. I mean, uh, I think in general, uh, if it's a paper that's very close to something you're doing, it's like, you know, very relevant, and the authors have released the code and so on, then you should probably go over their code and get to really understand how they do things. Because uh, I remember as a PhD student going over a code of uh, MRIs and Zubin, and I was doing something very similar to what they were doing at one point in time. It was really useful to see the tricks that they used in their code, and I ported some of those codes tricks <laughs> to my own code uh, as well. So, so then the reading, because the work is so close, then the reading is very, I mean, it's very intimate, and and I think there's something that comes up later, and eventually I ended up reaching out to them and. In fact, with time, we became good friends um, <laughs> because we shared that common experience during our PhDs. Um, Jan, would you like to add something? Yeah, uh, so I, I would echo what uh, Nando said. Like, 
for some reason, there are certain tricks that aren't prominently featured in the papers that you know people use, and people kind of assume that people know that they use it, and you won't really find out unless you read the code, sadly. So definitely, it is useful to read the code sometimes. As part of the part about you know reading papers, I think definitely you should think of reading papers as an integral part of your job. So spend, spend a good amount of time doing that, basically. And it also makes you a very valuable resource for your collaborators. Now they're going to come to you more often with ideas. And that's going to give you a chance to you know, maybe work on very interesting stuff. So don't, don't neglect that part. OK. So next question, how to do a proper literature review, especially for when you want to write a paper or when you start a, you're starting your PhD. At the beginning, you have to do your literature review. When is the most efficient time to do this literature review uh, to make sure that you're not reinventing the wheel? Um, should you do that before you start the project or after you've run some experiments and gotten some, some intuition? What would be your advice? I would say it's a mix of doing that sort of playing a bit with your idea. I think it's important to get some intuition. It's probably best not uh, the first thing that you do is hit Google Scholar because then you're going to be frustrated. You, then you're going to start thinking that, oh, it's all been done. <laughs> uh, so it's important that you push your idea for a little bit, uh, work with your, be creative. Um, um, but then eventually you also need to come down to reality and be grounded. And then so, so then look for, um, whatever words you think of describing your idea, start typing them in Google Scholar or in Google and try to find out what this could be related to, talk to your collaborators. And then if you find related papers, that's when you start following what I suggested, which is look at the references in those papers, uh, look at which paper cite that paper, and then you should spend uh, a few days just becoming aware of what the literature is and trying to refine your idea. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Doina, something to add? Uh, this is all great advice. The only thing that I would add is, again, at the beginning of a PhD, it's worth taking some time uh, looking at the literature in the broad area that you are interested in and learning the fundamentals and reading the seminal papers. And also mm -hmm. looking a little bit at the recent work in that area just to see like what's the gist of stuff that, that people are, are doing. And actually at McGill, there is this uh, interesting uh, sort of comprehensive exam that is that happens one year into your, your PhD that I find actually quite a useful exercise where people have to select about 15 or 20 papers with a particular topic, you know, whatever it is, hierarchical reinforcement learning, you pick the topic with your advisor and it should be aligned to, to what you're thinking of, of studying. And then they have to write a survey based on these papers, but they have to, sort of make it all together. So you need to, you know, make the notation all unified and put all the ideas into one framework and explain them to a group of people who are computer scientists, but not in your research field. And so I find that's a really useful exercise, both to understand what are the important papers to look at in this area that you want to study, but also to make sure that you really understand them in a way that you can explain them uh, to, to other people, so. Yeah. Um, Jan, would you like to add something? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, all of this. Uh, I guess, yeah, the, the key thing is, you know, even if it seems maybe that your idea in its current form exists, just remember that this is a fluid process. Maybe your idea can evolve. Maybe you can improve upon the paper that, you know, that you found, or maybe you'll realize that there is actually a a meaningful difference between the previous work and the current work. So, you know, don't necessarily uh, get discouraged if, if you're doing the, the literature review really early, as, as Nando mentioned. But definitely do the literature review. <laughs> very, very important. <laughs> so I think this was already mentioned, like, if you re I read a paper that is very close to my research interests, should I reach out to the authors? How do I do that? Do I try to establish a collaboration? And then there's another follow-up question, but I just didn't put it here. If I'm in, from a smaller lab and I, um, I publish a paper, but that goes overlooked, 
and then a, a big company like i don't know google facebook publishes something very very similar but with amazing results because they have more computational power should i even try to to, to get credit for this because you know i published it first or or how should i approach these kind of things uh, so maybe nando i'm there can... first okay <laughs> so i think it's a good idea um... Um, especially in the second case of contacting the authors and letting them know. Because uh, I think by and large, most people uh, realize that, okay, this, you know, this, you know, we'll go and read a paper. Um, you should do that in a polite way, obviously. <laughs> you shouldn't say, you know, you stole my idea. That's not going <laughs> to go well. Um, and you should do, do due diligence you should really make sure that the ideas are related because there's nothing more annoying for a researcher than when someone contacts you and says you know i did the same thing five years ago and then you read it and you're like really <laughs> <laughs> i mean if you stretch it maybe <laughs> so this happens often and often actually tends to be senior people that contact junior people and say you know i did this <laughs> 30 years ago. Not giving no, no, names. No, no, like, no, not giving no, names. No, but. No, okay. <laughs> um, the, the other thing in terms of contacting, it also, I always found when I was a student more helpful to contact other students than to con contact professors. Because uh, one, I was more likely to get an answer. And two, I was more likely, uh, more likely to actually get a meaningful answer. You know, when that's actually accurate, because at the end of the day, it was like the other student was the one that was actually doing the research, and then so we could actually engage in a more meaningful uh, conversation than by talking to some professor. Um, also, people, I mean, if you reach out to say Joshua or Benji or something, it's quite likely, I mean, it would be surprising if they reply to you. They're very busy people and so on. So I think you'll, uh, you'll get more from uh, uh, approaching, uh, you know, sort of the most junior people. Um, and in, in terms of establishing a collaboration, well, that's kind of, that sort of depends if it's another academic lab. If, if you feel like there is a reason why, if you were to combine efforts, you could do better, then I think it's useful to establish that collaboration. But sometimes just to find out um, that, that, you know, just to get to know someone um, that has similar interests to you and that would like to brainstorm research with you is also very useful. So that's part of how you grow your network. I think we should always try to do it in a positive way and uh, try to um, build that network from when, when, when we start our careers. And because still to this day, most of the friends that I have in my field who I brainstorm ideas with were the people who I used to brainstorm ideas with 20 years ago. Yeah. So yeah, I, from my own experience, yeah, I think this is really important to try to find collaborators that share the same interests, especially if you're in a lab and you're working on a topic and the other, uh, your colleagues are not working on the exact same topic, then it's really good to try to reach out to someone uh, from another lab such that you, you create this collaboration to, to bounce ideas with, um, yeah. Uh, Doina, would you like to add something? Uh, the only thing I'll add is that you should not panic if you see something that looks very similar to your work. This happens all the time. You know, the field is at a certain state of knowledge. And so there's some immediate next steps. And many people may realize the, that these are the next steps sort of simultaneously. Uh, and this is not a new situation and it's not new to machine learning. It happens in all fields. And so it's just important to uh, sort of give credit and, and try to reach out. And that doesn't mean that you have to strike a research collaboration necessarily, right? But, uh, you know, if papers are contemporary, for example, they may decide to just cite each other and discuss each other's work in the related work section in a more detailed way, right, for example. And if a collaboration is not necessarily, as Nando said, at least you know that people are thinking about this, that it's a good idea, and that you have some other people with whom you could chat, you know, at conferences or occasionally, right, to, to kind of sync up, and that can be very valuable as a, as a networking opportunity. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, yeah the, the only thing I would add to that is that, uh, yeah, conferences are a really useful tool for this. Uh, go to the poster session, ask questions, maybe tell the author, hey, do you want to talk more about this? And you talk more about this. Something that has been very useful for me is inviting, you know, uh, researchers who have worked on very related papers, maybe publish at the same conference, and we huddle somewhere during the conference and we talk out. And even you can share very openly, you know, what are you working on right now? What are you working on right now? And because really we're just all trying to move the field forward, so why not do that, right? And that way you're, you're not necessarily setting up a collaboration, but you're setting up a, a network of people that you know you can discuss ideas with, maybe understand certain things better, and that's, that's incredibly valuable. Yeah, so I, I really hope that we will go back to like conferences and summer schools uh, in person because the, the networking part is really important there. And this is not great for maybe for the online events, but yeah, hopefully this uh, will uh, will get back to, to normal soon. Okay, so maybe we move now to the how to write a paper. And Nando, I know that you have a few slides. Maybe you want to share uh, those. And then, yeah, uh, Nando has some great advice on how to write papers. And uh, we start with that, and then we'll, we'll continue with, uh, with the questions here. Uh, Nando, you're muted now. Uh, could you please unmute, Nando? Apologies. <laughs> um, can you see the slides that I'm trying to present right now? Uh, I on, do. Yeah. Um, yes. That's one thing that Google Meet could improve, so that I could actually see the slides <laughs> as I present and see you as well. Um, so these thoughts are from uh, the Indaba, which is a deep learning summer school we have taught in Africa for going now for the fourth year. And uh, the same sort of things were used in Kipo. And a few people have uh, put a lot of resources together. So what would be nice, perhaps, Virik, if, you, uh, if there's a way of sharing with all the students uh, yes. some of these slides as well as the, the slides from the Indaba. Yes. Um, usually this goes on for two hours, but so I'm going to be very quick about how to write a paper. There's, um, um, I'll just go over a few points, which I think are fundamental that everyone should know. Like first read the conference guidelines. Like if you're going to submit a paper to NeurIPS, it tells the reviewers what things they should be looking for, clarity, originality, significance, and so on. So you should make sure that you're optimizing for these things. Uh, you should follow the scientific method. If you make a claim uh, in the introduction, the experiment should validate that, cl uh, that claim. And then in the discussion at the end of the paper, you should go back and say, yes, the experiments have validated this claim. So you should repeat the same statement at least three to four times in the paper. Um, you should have ablations. So sometimes your method is really a combination of several things. And so it's important then to know how much is each component of your solution is contributing to the solutions. So at that stage, do the evaluations. Um, always start by implementing the baselines because the, the most simple ways of solving it sometimes are actually um, um, like, really useful um, and, and it will allow you to see what you actually can do better. So like, for example, in, in, in deep learning, there's been probably a thousand papers claiming to do better than LSTMs. Um, um, but it, funny enough, people still use LSTMs. <laughs> um, and that's because they're very good models. And, and I think the same could be said about sort of many other things like BERT or Confnets and so on. So the baselines are important. 
Um, point five is important. Um, you, you should be able to list what your paper, what the contribution is to the paper in point form. Um, before you write a paper, this you should be able to have in point form in introduction. This is what this paper shows. Um, it has to be clear. It has to be precise um, because that's what the reviewers will be looking for. Um, with plots, um, make, make sure that the, uh, the fonts are clear, that the line work is clear. Um, never underestimate the value of graphics and images. Uh, most of the ideas in machine learning that we remember of, like if you think of SVMs, you think of an image. If you think of a covenant, you think of an image. Images have really become these canonical ways in which we remember most of the sort of things that have happened in deep learning. Um, they're, so to speak, iconic. Um, it is very important to invest time drawing good images that really describe your method. And even sometimes having in the first page or second page an image that describes your approach with a big caption that describes what everything is about, you should be able to communicate your paper just with one image and a big caption. Um, because that's, you know, that's imagine that you're writing it so that uh, for say so, so for a magazine and so on, um, that should be enough. So it, it's, it's useful to look at how science papers get written, nature and so on, to, to get that idea. Um, references, bibliography. Uh, with bib files, uh, so we write papers with latex. Um, and so become used to latex. You should have a bib file. And if you're working on a particular topic, I su suggest strongly that for that topic, you start, as you read papers, get their bib entry and put that bib entry in your bib file. Because at the time of writing the paper, all the bibliography will be available to you. And in that way, you can actually clean the bib file because usually what you find online is a bit messy. So that gives you a chance to attack that. Um, if you like um, an idea that's on a paper, or if you like how it's been explained for like people who are not first language, whose first language is not English, write it down. Like I always maintain the notebook actually. And whenever I saw something was explained really well, I would write it down in my notebook. And, and you know, I carried this notebook for many years, even, even as a professor, um, because it's, it really improves your writing style. And also, because some people sometimes they just like nail it. They're able to explain a complex an idea with just a paragraph in a beautiful way that, you know, that it's, you, you couldn't think of doing in the same way. So at that point in time, it's good to write it down the process of writing down, I think it helps you internalize it. Um, you should write related work as you go. Don't wait for the deadlines because you've been reading all these papers say, from Google Scholar or, or from your network of collaborators. And so as you read them, um, maybe you can start typing a little summary of what the paper is about. Um, Another thing about LaTeX is LaTeX allows you to use macros for notation. So papers must have consistent notation. You have to know, for example, that small bold letters are vectors, big bold letters are matrices and so on. And if you have a macro file in LaTeX, so figure out how to write macro files in LaTeX. If you have macro files and you use macros, um, because you're using macros, you're being forced to always use the same symbols and be consistent. So I highly recommend uh, having a macro file because it will make your notation consistent. Um, I think this point um, of thinking ahead about a paper while doing research. So when you do experiments and so on, you're trying different things. To make, sometimes you're just exploring, but you should start thinking, okay, what are the plots I'm gonna want to have in the paper? Stuart Russell, when I was um, he's, uh, doing a poster with him at Berkeley, he would make me actually draw by hand the plots that were going to be in the paper. I had to predict where each curve was going to be. And then I would sort of go and launch the experiment and to confirm whether those curves would be there or not. Um, I highly recommend doing that. And the most important piece of advice, that's why I made it so big, is this one story. Um, 
it's very tempting to write the when you do research you end up doing a, about one thing you end up doing a bunch of things and so it's it's very tempting you want to say everything you did uh, and that's a big mistake uh, you really need to be writing a paper with the reader in mind not with yourself in mind and you should be telling one story uh, it's a story that will make sense to that reader it's maybe you did many more things but by having talking about more things it's just going to confuse the reader the reader is going to start wondering about okay so what is this really about um, no you want to simplify things you want to have one story and you meant to tell the story in the abstract you repeat it in introduction the story is backed up with experiments and you confirm the story in your uh, in your results um, it's really one thing that you, the paper is about and you should always focus on it being one thing um, it's the most common mistake I think people make. Um, in the last slide here, what I just have is a bunch of links. So in particular, actually, the, the one at the bottom, how to write a research paper, that's a video that's available at Microsoft. Um, at Indaba, we always go through the slides of Simon Payton Jones. It's like it takes us about two hours. I highly, highly recommend going through that. It, it's one of the best things you could do with your time um, ahead of writing a uh, paper. Um, at Kipo, David uh, Lopez Paz um, came up with uh, really good resources on how to uh, improve your writing. Um, there's this excellent book by William uh, Strunk and White uh, on the elements of style. I highly recommend that too. It's, a, it's very good tips. Um, and the other two links as well have, are sort of very useful. Um, so I, I hope these links become available to everyone. Um, and I would say it's worth spending a week just like reading this, these resources, um, because a big part of being an academic is not just the great research you do, but how you communicate it. What makes people like many researchers like Andrew Ng, Joshua Benjo, and so on, really good researchers is because they have this excellent ability of communicating their ideas. Um, and to be successful, I think as a scientist, you need to be able to say what it is that you've done. If you have a great idea, but you can't communicate it, your paper will likely be rejected, people will not understand you. And then being angry because people don't understand you is counterproductive. Um, so what you really should do, you, sh you should strive to learn to communicate as well as you can um, to be able to have more impact. Okay, so that's my long presentation. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. I think these are really very valuable resources. Um, <clears throat> and yes, we will make all the slides available for the for the participants to go on, to go through the resources that you recommended. Um, and maybe we can just continue with uh, with the questions. So yeah, Nando mentioned some, but maybe Doina, Jan, can you think of other common mistakes that uh, beginners do uh, when they start writing papers? So this was like. Oh, sorry. Oh, Go ahead, Jan. So um, yeah, so this was like really complete, really aced it. Uh, I, I I'll go into like one detail, which is. Uh, so Nando was talking about how you need to explain things well, and I think a very important component of that is situating your contributions very well in the literature. That's a very, very positive sig signal for the reviewers and the people that are reading your paper. Like when they understand, okay, this is what has been done before, this is what I'm proposing, uh, I, I think that only makes your paper stronger, uh, but when you're starting out, I think naturally you kind of feel like, oh, let me not, you know, uh, be as upfront as possible about, you know, how awesome previous work has been. No, just be be as uh, factual as possible. Basically. Yeah. yeah, I think this makes a lot of sense, and uh, like uh, we have to think that most likely the reviewers will be people that have written very related work to that paper. So you should better discuss properly the the existing work. Uh, such that you position yourself correctly. Yeah, that, that's that's a great advice. Yeah, um, Doina, you want to add something? 
And so first of all, I just wanted to say it was a fantastic presentation by Nando, and uh, I think it would be great to disseminate the slides and we should make them available also, you know, to the outside world for sure. Um, I, I will just want to echo one point, which is the paper is about one topic. And <laughs> sometimes people might want to cram in more because they think if there's more results, there's going to be more chance of the paper being accepted. But it's just so much easier for somebody to grok one topic that is done very well than to, you know, deal with three topics that are all done a third of the way. Yeah. Okay, maybe uh, going to the next question. How do I know when I have enough contributions to write to write a paper? Because very often we, we yeah, we're tempted to think, oh, next deadline is, new deadline is in a month. What will I submit? Uh, but probably that's not a great uh, mindset to have. So how do I know when I'm ready to, uh, to actually start writing the paper? What is your opinion on this? That's a great question. And it's often, you know, of course, if you're a PhD student, that has to be discussed with your advisor. And typically your advisor and also other people that you collaborate with your committee will be able to tell you. And you should listen to that advice because they want you to submit a paper when that paper is ready. So they want it to be successful and they, you know, they don't want you to have to deal with 10 rejections in a row. Uh, so they, they really, you know, almost all the time have your best interests at heart. And of course, if you're working in a team, then it's often your collaborators and, and your team members that, that will tell you. And, um, you know, just because there's a deadline, that is not a good reason to put out some work. Um, now, you know, what is enough contribution? That is difficult to answer generally, right? Um, but certainly if there is a clear idea that seems to work empirically or has interesting theoretical results attached to it, um, then it's worth uh, trying to write the paper. If your idea is a combination of things and the results are marginal and so on, is it worth really trying to stretch it into a paper? Well. I mean, you know, one thing that that is useful is actually to think, would I like to write to, to read this paper if it's out there? Would I read it personally? And if you wouldn't read it, then you shouldn't write it. And there's also a trade off in terms, like I've said before, in terms of the amount of time, because it's not a zero amount of time that you need to spend. You actually need to spend a lot of time writing the paper and perfecting the writing and doing a few little extra experiments and so on. So if you don't believe that this work is ready, then you can better spend those days instead of, you know, cramming the two weeks before New York, you can better spend those two weeks, uh, you know, really trying to make a progress and, and make a contribution. Ian, would you like to add something? Um, yes. Um, I think one practical thing that you can do to kind of know if you have enough contributions is first i mean, I mean this is obviously the the right way is as Dona mentioned you know ask your collaborators ask your advisor but let me address the case what, what if you don't have one what if you're working you know at home or you know your your collaborators also don't know as much so here's one thing that you could do if you choose the problem correctly when you make a when you solve that problem it kind of gives you a good indication that you know you're ready. So how to do that? Uh, well, you can read past papers. You can see their future work, and that can help you. That can give you like a, a compass to kind of figure out where to go. You can also look at again previous work and see well what are things that they kind of failed at. You know what what are some of the weaknesses of the method that they've proposed. You know maybe it's very computationally expensive, and maybe you have an idea to fix that. So, you know, grounding it in, you know, past work is, is a useful way to know that, you know, you're kind of working in the correct direction if you don't have better indicators. Yeah, th that's great advice. Uh, Nando, would you like to add something? You're muted. <laughs> I'm terrible with this mute. Um, everything that's been said, and I would add that um, if at some point you're still are in doubt and so on, but you sort of think that it's good work, but 
you're not 100 percent sure we're never 100 percent sure that someone hasn't done this before or that this is trivial or, or, or whether this is relevant um what you can do is you can upload uh, upload it to archive when you're happy with it. You should be happy with it before you upload it to archive. You should have made sure that the experiments are there. Don't arch don't submit something to archive you're not entirely happy with because it's going to haunt you for the rest of your life. Twenty years in the future, you're going to look back, and 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 then there's that stain there in your academic career. <laughs> so it, it is important. You always think about. How will I feel in 20 years time when I look back? Will I be happy with this, that I did this? Um, and so I think that's very important. At the end of the day, that's all you have. You can optimize for many things, but in 20 years time, you should be happy with the life you led. <laughs> um, and so one possible strategy then is you put your paper in archive and then you can email other people that sort of work in the area uh, so we go back to sort of contacting other, say, junior people uh, and so on working in your area. And you can say, look, I've just uploaded this paper to archive. Um, just gives you an idea of what I'm working on uh, or, att or I've attached it here to this email. And I would love to, to get your thoughts on it before I consider submitting it for a conference. Because that's what might actually lead to, so people might just ignore it or might say, okay, that's awesome, or I don't have time for it, or it's trivial. Or they might even say, oh, I really like it. I've been thinking of something similar, but I was going to do this other thing. And so that might be even the beginning of a collaboration. So I would rather sort of try to move toward a way of disseminating results that sort of foments collaboration and um, before like just, you know, hitting the conferences. Because, yeah, there's, there's not enough reviewers for all of us to be submitting every possible idea to a conference. Yeah. And I think we will have a, a question exactly about archive, just, uh, or maybe, we, or yeah, let's not uh, skip because we will lose track. Uh, so especially for, as Nando mentioned, especially for um, uh, people that are not uh, native uh, English speakers, um, should I fear that my paper will be rejected because of the style of the writing? Uh, or uh, like, what are the reasonable causes for rejecting my paper? If I have typos, will that paper be rejected? Or what, what, what are the main <laughs> things I should worry about? So just to be a little bit more clear on it, when you say style, do you mean also kind of incorporating the quality of the writing in there or really just very superficial? Like, yes, uh, in terms of the, the writing, like the actual writing, like you have the idea and then you have the actual writing, how you present the idea. Um, and how, how my, which one is most important uh, and mistakes in which part will uh, will can cause rejection of a, of a paper. I, I think this is what the, what the, the question is is targeting. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, content is super important. Substance, definitely. Uh, style can get in your way. So if it's if your paper is very impenetrable, for example, you have a bunch of very obscure non-standard notation, and you never ever define what it means that's probably going to get in the way of uh, you know, your paper being accepted. So as much as possible, you know, try to use more standard you know, known notation. Uh, if you're going to use something that is not well known, have a notation uh, section. Uh, and then in terms of the quality of the writing, I think it's very uh, important. But if a paper is difficult to understand, like basically at the edge, like difficult to understand, but you can still understand it, is it is it fair that it would get rejected? I would say no, but is it likely to get rejected? I would say probably, because uh, it's, it's quite likely that one of the reviewers or two of the reviewers will not have gotten it and will not be very supportive of the paper. Uh, so it, it's not like clear cut, but that, that's my thoughts on it. Yeah, so I guess as Nando mentioned, like it's also very important how we communicate and how we present uh, the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Reina, would you like to add something? Mm, the math always has to be very clear, and there's whether you're a native speaker or not, the notation and making sure that those things are not don't contain typos is really important. 
Um, and then aside from that, uh, you know, it's always a good idea to me to have the paper read if possible by somebody, like if language is an issue, if you can get the paper read by somebody who is either a native speaker or is a better speaker, uh, can help a little bit. Um, but, you know, over time you also learn how to communicate. So like if, if the paper gets rejected and you get a review that basically says, I think there's some good ideas in there, but I just couldn't understand it you should take that as constructive feedback, right? That means that that's a part that you have to, to work on and then you work at it. Yeah. Uh, Nando, would you like to add something? Yeah, just adding to Dina's last point, if your paper gets rejected and you feel like all the reviewers didn't understand, if they didn't understand, it's probably because you weren't clear. That's the <laughs> most likely reason they didn't understand. So I have this, um, and it used to be worse, it's kind of, I guess, as you know, that this gets easier. With enough rejection, you get used to it. Um, but there's this thing where the first time you get the reviews and the negative reviews, especially if it was a paper that you really believed in, it's always really upsetting and how could I not have got it and so on. And these days I see that with um, more junior people and my team, and and you just have to kind of uh, always remember that if they didn't understand it, it was because probably we didn't make the arguments clear enough. So we should just have another go at, and and I think the second time you write a paper, it's always better, um, and and it's part of the process. We should not feel like a failure or something because a paper gets rejected. It happens all the time, and and I actually know. Um, one of my collaborators, I think it's happened with him twice, and in fact it happened with him twice in a row, that he had a paper rejected, and then he resubmitted the paper, sort of cleaned it up, wrote it better, and resubmitted, and got a best paper award. So he had best paper awards at the Ichikai and ICML for you know having had just a rejection the, the year before in both cases, and that was two papers in a row. And the third time he got the pa another paper rejected, we were all excited about it because we thought he was on to get another paper award. <laughs> <laughs> but the induction process failed. <laughs> okay, so continuing with this uh, idea of having papers rejected and so on. So if my paper is rejected and I think it's uh, maybe unfairly rejected, should I just resubmit and try my luck with, again with a different set of reviewers? Uh, also, how to write a good rebuttal? I have to admit, I don't know how to write a good rebuttal. I think I've never gotten <laughs> to improve my uh, my rebuttal. So I'm actually interested as well in this uh, question. Uh, Jan, would you like to start? Yeah, I really like this question. Uh, I, th I think like, you know, uh, getting your paper rejected is a very necessary part of being a researcher. And uh, yeah, it's important to deal with this well. I really like also that unfairly is in parenthesis, kind of like all rejections are kind of unfair basically when it's your paper that's being rejected maybe. Um, so I think the biggest mistakes that, the biggest mistake that people make is that they think, oh, the rejection is unfair. And so I will submit the exact same paper to the next conference. And so many times, either me as the reviewer or me yeah, as the AC, I see the exact same reviewer post a similar review and kind of mentioning, well, you haven't changed the paper since the last time. So don't, you don't want that to happen to you. So uh, take into account the, the feedback, very important. Even if you think, oh no, nobody, like the, the reviewer is really missing the point for not having understood that this is irrelevant. Well, make, explain, ex explain things better so that people you know, don't don't uh, don't have the same misunderstanding. That's that's one thing that you can do. In terms of writing better rebuttals, uh, the times where it's gone from like you know likely rejected to likely accepted are when you know there's one reviewer that is not convinced, and you focus on that reviewer and you provide you know the arguments or the evidence necessary for them to change their score, basically. Yeah. Joina, would you like to go for 
Next yeah, time. so so in terms of the rebuttal, it's always tricky, right? Because most of the time you write a rebuttal and it makes no difference. And it's really, like Anne said, there's sometimes a case where there's one reviewer who has possibly misunderstood, possibly they made a mistake, right, in, in writing their review, uh, or somehow they're not convinced and you can flip their opinion by providing the right arguments. And even if that reviewer doesn't flip, you know, if they were somehow wrong, you can make the area chair see that, right? And, and in the end, it's an area chair decision. Um, what does not work is promising to make a lot of changes. <laughs> because, you know, if the paper is on the fence and people have a long list of complaints and you say, oh, we will address all of these in the final version, of course, nobody will get to see that final version before it gets published. And so because there's no cycle as with journals, that's kind of a useless uh, exercise. Um, and again, like, you know, how much time do you spend writing the rebuttal and fretting about it uh, versus, you know, working on other things? Like at some point you, you have to pick your battles. If it doesn't look like the paper is, is convincing at this stage, it should just embrace the fact that there's some useful feedback. You'll have some rewriting to do. You'll have some experiments to rerun and you just go ahead and do it. And absolutely you should not submit the same paper again. Uh, in its current form, because if those reviewers have spent some hours reading your paper and providing advice, uh, you know, even if you don't agree with that advice, you know, this is the external eyes looking at your work. And so, you know, it means you have to do a better job of, of communicating it and, and try your best to uh, to embrace that. Advice. Maybe just a short follow up, like when is, um when do I have evidence to contact the area chair? Like if I am not uh, satisfied with the reviews and I think the reviewers didn't understand, when should I contact the area chair to, to try to find resolution in a different way? So there is, in my head, there's two cases and I have seen both cases happen. One is when a reviewer has uh, made an obvious mistake, right? There's a proof, the reviewer says the proof is wrong, but they are wrong. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. And so then you should flag it to the area chair because, and you know, if anything, the area chair can get another opinion on this. Uh, the other situation is there are sometimes rare cases where, uh, you know, it's somebody, let's say, who's working in the same area and just does not want paper published. And so they are a malicious reviewer. It does happen. It's not often, but it, it can happen. And so if you suspect that this is a person that is somehow uh, you know, maliciously trying to shoot this down, and it is a dissenting opinion, then you can contact the area chair and voice those concerns. And then again, you know, of course, you don't know who the reviewers are, but the area chair knows who the reviewers are. They can decide if your concerns are warranted, and they can also decide if an extra reviewer uh, is necessary for them. Great. Uh, Nando? Any advice? Yeah, so I guess this is going to sort of lead to the next question, Verika. Uh, so it's about <laughs> if you put your paper first on archive, you already have a timestamp for it. So if there is really a malicious reviewer, the worst they could do to you is not let you go to that conference uh, in Hawaii or whatever it is in the old <laughs> days. But you will still get a timestamp on archive uh, for, for, for your paper and if other people are interested in it and citing it, it will be counted positively uh, during your PhD. Um, reviewing is necessarily adversarial. We've, we made it adversarial because that's the most effective way of progressing as a field. So don't take it too hard. So, you know, when I read papers, I also try to find flaws with them as a reviewer. We are the reviewers. I mean, we, the writers, are also the reviewers. We sort of review papers and write papers. And so when I review papers, and I have been wrong uh, reviewing papers. I mean, because I've not understood the idea. Um, you know, I have just a couple of hours to read this paper because I have a million other papers to review <laughs> and so on. And so it may be that in those two hours, if the idea isn't very clear, this is again why this should be, you know, all the advice I was giving before, if the idea isn't very clear, we don't get it, then you might make the wrong decision. Um, and, um, but yeah, like when I read papers, I'm looking for flaws to read, to try to reject these papers, you know, I'm trying to falsify. And, and eventually you kind of, well, 
actually they've done their experiments well and this is inspiring and so on yeah this paper should be accepted maybe uh and so you make that recommendation um so it's imp once we accept that the game is adversarial then it will play against us sometimes and we need to accept it um and we need to accept the fact that there will be reviews that especially if an idea is very original um or it, it is likely will be rejected the first few times i think every sort of great idea that gets published the first time is likely to be rejected um and being upset contacting area chairs and so on is all counterproductive i think in my career i've done all those things and uh, being upset uh, contacting the area chairs about you know this review is so off and so on um, and that's never helped. So, like, if I can give you a piece of advice, is don't bother to antagonize the reviewers or the area chair. Just take the advice. Write, try to write a more clear presentation for the uh, of your ideas. Um, do the whatever extra experiments they ask you to do, baselines and so on, uh, and then write something better. My exp in my experience, the paper always improves the second time. The reason why ZU got those paper awards was because the papers were much better than the, than the earlier versions that he had submitted. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with, uh, with that. So maybe just a, a follow-up question and not, uh, not on the slides. Um, so we, we all uh, have a lot of frustration with the reviewing system that, uh, yeah, sometimes we think that the reviewers are, are wrong and so on. Is there something that we could do as a community to improve the quality of the reviewing and of the publishing system? I don't, if you have any advice, any any opinions on, the, on this, how, how to train reviewers, better reviewers, how to make uh, our, our the members of the community to be better reviewers? Any any thoughts on this? Any anyone? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a yeah. Go ahead, Jan. Jan, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. It's a hard problem. Uh, I think we've I, I discuss this like very often. Uh, usually, you know, after submission or, or on rebuttal time, you know, what can we do to improve the reviewing process? Especially as right now, uh, the conferences are growing, you know, exponentially. More and more papers are getting submitted, and the number of reviewers is not really growing <laughs> exponentially. So. Uh, that's really difficult. Um, I think maybe one way, one direction maybe uh, to think in is we're kind of mixing judging the correctness of papers with how you know popular they're going to be or how you know I don't know novel they're going to be. And maybe if we disentangle those two things, that you know we we have some papers that are where we're just judging you know the correctness of you know, the paper, and that would be just one step above archive that would require maybe less time. or And, and you'd have maybe a, a different step where, oh, we're gonna include it inside of the proceedings of the conference. And maybe that has more scrutiny somehow. Uh, maybe that a tiered uh, uh, system maybe would be, would be some, a, a way to like decrease the the load and currently what they're doing is using desk rejection but that's not very popular with anybody i've talked to doina did you want to add something yeah so i think one of the issues is that it's very hard to evaluate the long-term impact that a paper will have and so a lot of the reviewing these days is you know is it correct and is it giving state-of-art results at least in the empirical papers. And, you know, the state of art changes all the time. I personally prefer papers that have ideas that are new ideas, interesting ideas, even if the execution is slightly flawed. So you're not getting state of art, or maybe the experience could have been slightly better, but if the idea is very exciting and I can see the potential, I really like that. I think with junior reviewers, it's very hard to get these kinds of papers past them and so as a result, you see a lot of incremental stuff, right? The state of the art moving by 0.1 of a percent from paper to paper because, you know, they fit the state of the art. And so we understand what that means. And it's harder to evaluate um, sort of the conceptual contribution sometimes. Um, because we have so many junior reviewers, this is just very, very hard to, uh, to manage this kind of thing. 
Um, the other, the only other thing I'll say is, if you are doing a review, um, you know, and and uh, you have some feedback. For example, you don't understand a section, you think it's not clear, or you think that empirically they should have also compared against X, Y, Z, right? Put those things in the review because that's very useful information. Like it, there should be content there rather than I don't like this paper or I think it's incremental, right? The line or two does not help. But telling people here's some ways you could improve it, that can be very, very helpful and, and authors do appreciate that. So in my experience, I think reviewing has improved. I mean, this is my subjective experience, but I actually look at the, if I look back at the reviews I used to get for near like 20 years ago, and the, the review, which were like two liners, uh, and the, the standards were much lower. Um, and it's because as Tony pointed out, maybe there was more interest in just like ideas as opposed to well-executed experiments. Or which maybe we don't even have the computing infrastructure to do proper experiments in those days. So there was less emphasis. You know, if you if you could just fit a line to 10 data points, you, you were in business. Um, <laughs> um, so then so then a lot of the sort of more sort of foundational ideas were developed and so on, because you didn't have to spend so much effort doing experiments. Nowadays to get a paper into ISML in Europe. It's extremely hard. The amount of experimentation or theory that has to go into those papers, it, it, it's, it's really cumbersome. And that's why quite often we have papers with several authors and so on. Um, fortunately, and, and I think with reviewing, we've seen the same thing. Reviews have become much more sophisticated. Now, you know, you see these two page reviews on, um, and in like open review and so on for a lot of papers. And a lot of them are really good, I think. You know, I've a lot, I had all my papers before ICML rejected, and you know, they were excellent reviews, and you know, um, so I have to accept that. Um, it's easy to complain, but I think the quality has improved actually. And I think people, especially young people, so are much more conscientious about doing good reviews. Um, it's also important to have venues like to Doina's point, like. So we have like workshops as part of conferences where the bar is a bit lower, where you can sort of throw in new ideas or you can throw in a new idea at the archive. So it or put the paper on some other website, Reddit or whatever. Um, in fact, for this paper that I really liked, the GPT-3, I doubt that paper would be accepted at near of or ICML <laughs> because if you look at the scores, originality, the review would be like, um, so you moved a layer um, from the output to the input. So that's it, that's the change of the model. You made it bigger. Okay, they're just making it bigger is, there's, I mean, how do we get better understanding? Um, you know, so, so, so a paper can be extremely interesting and provocative and, and it's great that this paper has appeared and everyone's talking about it. Um, but it might not necessarily have followed all the recipe that you need to follow to get the paper into a conference. Okay, great. Um, so maybe you can just move quickly over. The, so publishing on archive, um, I guess, Nando, you would recommend this uh, like for for work where we are not very sure or that, that uh, it's enough to submit to a conference or that has been rejected or, uh, maybe you want to develop just a bit on this. Um, so I wouldn't just like just dump everything on that. <laughs> I think it should be stuff that you, it still goes in there with your name, and you should be everyone's going to see this associated yes. with you. So this is your as a researcher, your name is sort of your brand. So you want to have that brand have high value. So you don't want to associate it with poorly written stuff. So it should be the best that you can you think you can do that you should be putting there. Um, but the nice thing about being able to put a paper on archive is that then it becomes public, then you can approach other people, you can refer them to the paper on archive and it's useful for engaging in discussions. It also gives you a timestamp to your idea in case your paper gets rejected at the conference. And I think this is important because um, what tends to often happen, and, and I've seen a lot of people crying about this, and so it's best to just avoid it, where they submit a paper to a conference, it gets rejected, and then two weeks later, the same paper appears published somewhere else. And 
and and I don't think this is malicious. I think it's just a. I've myself been. I think we all humans is a problem of cognition. You read many ideas in many papers, and and some of these ideas you might have read at this paper that you reviewed, and you forgot what you read this idea. And one morning you wake up or you're having a shower or whatever, and this idea comes to your head, and you don't know where this idea comes from, and you think it's your idea, and then you go and discuss with your collaborators, and you write a paper and publish. Uh, so it's quite conceivable that we could do this. And so to avoid this, I think the best way is just uh, after you submit a paper, put it on archive. Um, if you have strong reasons to not want your name associated with this paper, because you think that there's going to be a, um, a prejudice against that, that the reviewer might reject the paper once they know it's you, then I guess you will withhold it from archive. Um, but under most sort of normal circumstances, I would say it's good to make things public because that helps us get a discussion going. Okay. So I'll, I'll descend a little bit from that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to put on archive papers that are currently under review uh, because I do. F I have found in the past that there is bias, both positive and negative, that can happen from putting papers on archive during the review process and since review is supposed to be anonymized i'd rather not do that at the time of submission this being said once the paper outcome is known or even once the reviews are out right so at the rebuttal stage i feel like it's okay to put the paper on archive because you know at this point like the reviewing has been completed has done its job I think it would be fine if the review system was not anonymous. But if it is, then it, it's kind of weird to to go around that by putting the paper on archive because people will search archive, right? This is the fact that reviewers will look for, for these papers on archive. And then there's an extra piece of information, right? And the it does affect the conditional probability of, of the paper getting in. Yeah. Jan, would you like to add something or we can move to the next? Uh... Yeah, as for me, I, I haven't quite, you know, made up my mind about archive. There are some positives. Um, but at the same time, I'm a bit, you know, skept skeptical of it. Uh, though I, I do put some papers on archive sometimes, and definitely some very, very popular papers that have had a lot of impact are only available on archive and maybe would, well, clearly were not accepted anywhere else. So. It, it clearly has a role, but my understanding of its role is a bit still evolving. Okay. So for the next question, what are the guidelines for experiments? I think Nando covered uh, covered uh, quite uh, very well uh, this uh, in the slide. So we can, if you just have an advice of how to keep track of experiments, do you have any advice for people? Because like when you want to, to submit a paper, you have to do um, uh, ablation, hyperparameter uh, search and so on. Do you have any advice for how to keep track of experiments, like a spreadsheet, a document, any any advice there? So, I mean, notebooks and follow-ups are good and scripts are good, right? So you shouldn't run things by hand from command line. You should write the script and then you have the script. And ideally, like for example, when I, one of my colleagues in biomed engineering actually uh, has taught me this, that at the time that the student submits their PhD thesis, their scripts to run their experiments should be included with the thesis so that if somebody else comes along and they want to run, they should be able to run those scripts and th those are the scripts that produce the figures in the thesis. Okay. Um, maybe we can move. So this is like a, a big problem in the community and we all agree that it's very imp important like reproducibility. And many conferences now um, encourage uh, authors to submit uh, code, uh, source code with uh, with their submission. Do you think that uh, open sourcing the, the code uh, solves the problem or are there other ways in which we could uh, approach this, uh, th this, this aspect? Um, Jan, if you'd like to start. Yeah, uh, reproducibility, reproducibility is a super important goal. Uh, open sourcing definitely goes a long way, but it, it doesn't fully solve the problem. For example, uh, you know, you may have the code for the network that is state-of-the-art on ImageNet, but it costs a lot of money to reproduce it. And so how do you check? Uh, 
So I, I, I think, yes, open sourcing, great, but uh, maybe we, we need as a community to figure out uh, what, what else we could do to, to help with that. Okay. Nando, any thought on this? Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. It's uh, reproducibility is important. We should strive um, for reproducibility. I think reproducibility is not the same as the replication. I mean, you can replicate something. Uh, we're not talking about just reproducing means just running someone else's code. Um, but it's more like you should be able to say re-implement the same ideas in a different language. And it should still, if the ideas uh, are good and robust, in a, if you go and implement this thing in C++ or in a different type of class, it should still work. Um, so it's important uh, to do that. But yeah, having other people's code sometimes helps you see how uh, code is yet another way of communicating an idea. So you look at the diagrams at the paper, at the code, and you get a better understanding of what they've done. Um, and with it, sometimes it's also important to do research on uh, frameworks that enable reproducibility. So, so for example, the folks that spent a lot of effort designing Torch and that, that sort of goes back to um, work done by Jan LeCun and work done by a bunch of other people um, you know, in the early 90s, that they actually figured out how to write a framework for doing a machine learning that other people could use. And that kind of led to Torch and then, you know, and tools like Theano and eventually TensorFlow, PyTorch and all that. And once we have these frameworks, it becomes much easier to build work that will sort of that is easily reproduced by other researchers. Um, so I think it's important to, um, I think for big research labs and so on, to try to uh, continue supporting these frameworks, just like I think some a lot of the large companies have tried to do that. And now they're doing this for, uh, I know we are doing this for RL and a few other people are doing it. And I think it's important to do that. Um, clearly, some efforts will never be, you know, it's, you'll ne researcher will never be able to reproduce some results like, I don't know, GPT-3. You're not going to, you can't afford the millions, <laughs> easily afford the millions of uh, pounds or dollars that are needed to replicate the experiments in that paper. Um, so, but nonetheless, you should still read the paper and see kind of, because that gives you an idea of what is possible um, it, you know, if you had uh, several million dollars, uh, uh, what, you know, what sort of trends do you see? How will models generalize and so on? Um, but not be frustrated at the fact that you can't do that experiment. Just rather be happy that someone else can do it because at the end of the day, what we should care about is uh, seeing how the field progresses, not just our agenda. Dana, would you like to add something? So the only thing I want to add is that open sourcing the code does, is not an excuse for not presenting the idea clearly in the paper. You can't say, oh, I open source my code, therefore my algorithm is in that, in, is in that code. It's really like my algorithm should be in the paper and should be clearly described there. And the code, like Mando was saying, is yet another artifact that is used in conjunction with the paper. Yeah. Okay, so we will just very briefly go through through this about getting my paper cited. Uh, so I think we've mentioned earlier as well, like if you're from a smaller lab, then the, chance, the chances of your paper being overlooked are higher. Uh, what should I do as an author from, from such a lab? And uh, like we can relate to what is the role of social media in getting um, uh, citations, in getting your, your work um, uh, popularized. What, what are your takes on this? Um, Ian, if you would like to start. Yeah, so in the end of time, I'll keep my answer short. Uh, you know, what, what can you do if you are an author in a small app to popularize, you know, your paper? What I found is that uh, giving talks generously and to as many different audiences as possible is actually very, very effective. Uh, so that's my recommendation. Okay. Uh, Nando? One thing I always did as a PhD student was release the code. Um, because by releasing the code, I thought that the, 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 it, there was a higher chance that people were going to run my code as a baseline <laughs> and do better, and then I would get a citation. Yeah, definitely. Doina? 
Um, I, I like the idea of giving talks, you know, in workshops or for other research labs that are, uh, you know, perhaps working on related things uh, and, and make sure that talk is well prepared so that you can communicate clearly uh, your ideas and it, it can result in further collaborations and maybe an invitation to visit for a longer time and all that. Yeah. Great. Okay, we will skip this and we will end. So I will please just ask you to, to give a takeaway uh, a takeaway message for, for our participants. Um, Doina, what would you like to leave the, the people with from this discussion? And I think it's a, it's a really exciting time to be doing research in machine learning because we are understanding many more things. There is empirically these amazing results that are coming out, that some of which were mentioned in, in, in this panel. Uh, and there is a lot of opportunity to really use machine learning tools for other fields, right? Whether it's uh, healthcare, whether it's climate change and so on. And so, uh, you know, rather than being worried about productivity and publications and citations and so on, I think it's important just to enjoy it and, and to enjoy the intellectual stimulation and to uh, enjoy the fact that we are in a popular field and uh, do things that, that inspire you. Great. Uh, Nando? You're muted. <laughs> That'll be the last time. Um, everything done on this side, that, that's very inspiring. Do, do the stuff that makes you feel happy, that make you feel creative. And, um, and these are like wonderful, exciting times. I mean, the, the last decade has been it's been crazy so how, how many things we've seen coming and it's it's very transformative what's going on right now in the world and so there couldn't be a better time to sort of learn about it and be marveled at everything that's, that's being done and in terms of we pushing for our own path i think it's we got to do what we enjoy what makes us feel creative and also the, the sort of things that we think that in the future we would sort of look back and say, you know, I, I, I'm happy that I did that. Yeah. Jan? Um, maybe my takeaway would be, you know, if you're watching this, maybe you're at the beginning, beginning of your career and maybe you're very impressed and by, you know, other work that people are doing and you're maybe comparing yourself and uh, maybe that hurts your motivation. Sometimes I, I would say, uh, you know, set ambitious goals. Uh, everybody really like at this panel and everybody I know, you know, really started from the beginning, obviously, and they didn't know as much. They didn't have awards to begin with. So just be confident, you know, start learning. It's a, it's a, it's a long process. You won't, you won't from the first month or the first year, maybe get to the level where you're producing papers that are, you know, groundbreaking. Take more time, you know, maybe it'll take five years, maybe it'll take six years, but keep at it and, you know, you'll, you'll get where you want to go. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, all three of you, for participating. I think this has been an amazing discussion and very, very valuable in terms of mentorship, for especially for people who might lack mentorship in their, in their research group. So really, thank you for taking the time. It, it's been two hours, so this has been an intense, uh, intense discussion. Thank you for having the patience to go through all this uh, this question. So, and I am looking forward to doing this once in person when uh, when everything will go, be back to normal. So, thank you, thank you again. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.